Good morning and welcome to Cab Notes for, <coughs> this is what, July 2019? 12. 12. July 12, 2019. <laughs> okay, excellent. We have cooperation with the whole panel here. We all agree. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> this morning we're talking about, well, the title I made up was Praising the Purpose of the Pride Parade. I'm sure most of you <coughs> were either at the parade there a couple weeks ago or heard about it, but it, to me it was an extraordinary special event and I thought there was more joy in that parade than I'm seeing <laughs> Bennington since I've been here 50 years. So um, we have people here who are really intricately involved in this kind of uh, movement and why don't we start with Lisa here and she can maybe introduce some of the other people and tell Tell us where she comes from here. <laughs> sure. Um, so I'm Lisa Carton, and from Bennington, from here, yay! <laughs> Actually, all of us, well, we're not all from here. We've been here different lengths of time, which is interesting, too. But um, I've been living in Bennington a, almost 30 years, so mm. um, I, I also think I'm pretty proud of that. It was a joyful, joyful event, and it was exactly what I wanted it to be, fun, mm -hmm. safe, and joyful for everybody and we definitely uh, we definitely pulled that off it was amazing mm -hmm. um so um yeah in terms of i mean praising the purpose of pride parade it, it's a great topic um and maybe we can just go around and like let everyone introduce themselves and say a little about what that means because it means clearly different things to different people mm -hmm. um Rick, how long have you even been in Benningham? I'm realizing I don't know how long you've been here, but... Hi, Rick Thompson. Um, I have had a house in Pownall, which is uh, just right next door, for, mm, I don't know, 30 years. Oh. Wow. Um, but I re retired a couple of years ago and moved full-time mm. um, uh, to Pownall, so it depends on how you count it. I've either been here for a long time or a very short time. But in terms of being um, involved with the community, it's a relatively short time. So that's actually a really good point, involved with the community, because um, the community here, we could definitely talk about what that means. Um, in terms of an LGBTQ community here, it's been uh, right difficult <laughs> for me, I can say. I think probably many of us could relate to that who've been here for different periods of time. But it was actually really the, um, the, the motivating factor for me to finally say I'm going to do something different and uh, to create um, a little what, what I would call more community in this town definitely more visibility um, that I n you know we all know there's more LGBTQ people out uh, but they're here but they're not out yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we know you're here you right so um, but and Mark maybe you could introduce yourself because I know I met you right before all this happened and you were in the midst of developing something too in terms yeah, of that. Yeah, so my name is uh, <laughs> Reverend Mark Blank. I'm the pastor of Second Congregational Church here in Bennington. I got to Bennington uh, January of last year, and I got here and I was like, where are all the gay people? <laughs> where are the LGBT people? Um, uh, so visibility really was the word for me. And so we have a few uh, LGBT people in the church. I'm gay myself. And... Um, so this spring, I wanted we wanted to do something to create some kind of queer space in Bennington. So we had a we had an LGBTQ uh, game night, um, and so uh, just it was just a, a night where we said this is a queer space. This is an intentionally queer space, and we just tried to get people in a room together and um, to to kind of meet and have fun and maybe talk about visibility and. Yeah. And, and network a little. So, do you remember the date? Because that was—I know—that's when I met you. It was. It was in March. It was like March tenth, I think. Yeah, it was literally, and I don't remember the date I met you, but it was literally right around the same time that yeah. sort of, uh, I just became really aware that there was other parallel mm -hmm. processes happening here. That there were other people also wanting the same thing. 
knew people I hadn't met before and I had never yeah, met you before. No, I... And that kept happening. So like when that kind of thing happens, I've learned at this point in my life, like if you know, so you hear this and then you're here and you hear the same thing, it's like gets my attention, like, oh, right, we we're just talking about this. Yeah. Okay, so what do we do about that next, right? That's even bigger. Um so can we keep going around? Is that okay? Leia. Hi, Leia. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Leia. I was, I, I've been in Bennington for 11 and a half months. Um, <laughs> it's part of my year long AmeriCorps Vista service term. I, about, so my position is supposed to be focused on helping build organizations so that they can function successfully after you're gone. So about eight, nine months into my service term, um, I had the opportunity to help Lisa get Queer Connect off the ground. And that's how I came to get involved in all of this. Which is surprisingly only three months ago. Yeah, only three months, and we've gotten a lot done. It feels a lot longer. It really yeah. is incredible, Lisa, yeah. what you accomplished. Since it's March amazing to, short to, time. Get, to get that Pride event ha to happen, and yeah. it, it was amazing. It's it's really like a, a complete combined effort of so many people wanting it, yeah. and just a matter of how we tap into that. You know, um, that was a pretty that was a landmark moment when you came to me and said, "I, I want to help you." I literally think it was right after the banner ran that article, right? It was just before. Like I think you'd. I did the interview, but you they did hadn't the even interview, printed but it yet. It, it was like God, just I at the exact same time. <laughs> and I was, my head was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> wow, ask and you shall receive, which is exactly what part of the interview was about, which I had no idea they were going to print that. I didn't know what they were going to print. I didn't think they were going to print anything, but they put it on the cover, and it was more about that. Like, what, asking clearly for what you want, and then she came to me. And then, like, after that, honestly, like, then I... I think I met you like a month later, maybe less, when we had the first planning meeting. Yeah. And so many people came to the very first planning meeting. It was like, wow. It was amazing. Hmm. And um, all of it's been amazing. But um, then we were just talking about kind of goes in waves, right? So right. some of those people, that there's the initial burst of energy, and they're all excited about the idea. And then it wanes a little, and it's just us doing a lot. Right, and then other people come along. Yes, I think that uh, what what you've witnessed is that there is a latent um, enthusiasm and need mm -hmm. for um, celebration of LGBT people and their supporters, um, and yeah. pretty much anybody who thinks that equal rights and human rights are an important thing. But that mm -hmm. that latent need just needed an expression, um, and I think that to be able to do, to pull off what you and your team of volunteers did in, in a few short months um, um, shows that the need can be met um, mm -hmm. and that next time then there will be an expectation and it'll be a lot easier to do and a lot more people will know how to do it because I think mm -hmm. you were, you're in uncharted territory of how we to galvanize a team of people <laughs> and Mark too, as of, of there is that need there but once the need is met I think I'm hoping that it'll be mm. a lot easier for more events like that and more openness mm. because it's the openness that attracted me to getting involved in the effort because you spoke and perhaps you'd speak about it again but you spoke about meeting some of the kids um, at the local school mm. and their expressed need to see more people like them around mm. as one as you, oh. one of your motivating um, forces behind doing one. this. The biggest one and still is. It still is for me. It gives me goosebumps. I have goosebumps now. We spent the morning um, organizing a follow-up summer group for LGBTQ youth that we're going to have next week, believe it or not. They're Starting have a next week. Four-week group um, in the evenings for kids who traditionally, um, they don't have any supports in the summer. So I'm really happy that I'm pretty sure we're going to have a really successful group starting next week. So anybody who's interested in coming to that, <laughs> call um, 379-5456. Call like now. Um, we, we have we definitely have enough kids interested who are going to come. 
we're going to be planning a lot of events as a result of this. So I love what you said. It's not for me even about hoping. It's ab We don't even have to hope. It's happening. It's just, it is happening and we'll just keep doing it. We're just going to keep meeting the need, giving an expression, a, a, I would say a structure so that people can express their needs is huge. There hasn't mm -hmm. been that. Um, so, I mean, I'm putting my phone number out, I'm not joking, like having an actual number to call is a huge deal when someone's not known that there's anyone out there. Mm -hmm. I just saw someone post on, um, actually on our Facebook page, that there's the first trans hotline, suicide hotline for trans people. And um, it's a powerful thing when you hear that and part of me said, is that possible? It's the first one? Um, maybe to be called that in that way, right? But, but mm -hmm. it's powerful to know that there's a, a place where you can go and it's not always a space, it's not always a physical space. We actually don't have a office space or community space in that sense yet, um, but we're creating the space. So when we do a group like we're doing starting next week with the kids, we create that sacred space and then people mm -hmm. come. Pride created space. We mm -hmm. said, right, mm -hmm. we all said, where do we want to do this? And we created it, we picked together, and then we just invite people. Uh, yeah, there's a lot more things you need to do to be mindful of, to keep it safe is, pro is key, right, to make it a sacred safe space. Um, so, but not to lose track of what you said about kids. The kids, um, that was the inspiration when I met the kids at, at first over at the high school, and, the, and someone, one of the adults there said, what do you guys need? And they said right away, the first two things that they said were, we want, we need to see people like us out in the community. Yeah, adults like adults us. Adults like us. Oh. Hmm. And then the second thing was queer prom. Which we did. That we, we did it. <laughs> and I think we helped a lot on just the visibility front too. When we were lining up the parade, I was with a group of middle and high school kids um, and they were we were getting on the float that was towards the front of the parade mm -hmm. and they looked behind them and they just saw more and more people coming in and they they all just started saying wow I had no idea there were so many gay people here <laughs> yeah, that's so cute that was one of my most powerful moments too mm -hmm. as you know I was a marshal and I'm watching the parade go and when we finally got the last of it going and I started to work my way up and at one point I just I heard the crowd hit four I heard our parade hit four corners and it was right after the end of the last yeah. people were leaving and I was like is that possible they're already yeah. there <laughs> all the way down the hill I goosebumps because all the way I'm like yes so I'm like screaming out did you hear that we already reached four corners and look behind we're all the way up the hill we're stretching across town and the whole parade just started, yeah, oh my god, that was like, that still gives me goosebumps, my hair is standing up, right? That's incredible. Mm -hmm. I think one of the, um, I, I hate to introduce something negative after such a, <laughs> a joyous statement and a joyous memory, um, but one thing for me was, was very notable in the, not just the reaction at around the event but the reaction online and in the newspaper and in the news that mm -hmm. Sophie um, so ably handled um, but there was a lack of negative reaction um, so mm -hmm. often in today's world um, with the current politics and the current trends we read in the newspaper that um, hate crime is has increased in Vermont at a greater rate than most other states um, yet there was no evidence of that the, the, the Bennington Pride weekend was a joyous occasion with no negativity. So uh, I, I don't know what that says, but I think it's a good thing that it says. And that, I think that says a lot at different levels, and there's actually a lot of dialogue to be had about that, which is an important ongoing need. And we will be, we at Queer Connect um, are talking about the best, most effective way to work with that, and part of that is how we handle it in the media in terms of educating people. Um, but having said that, I would rather like go right into introducing you. <laughs> Rick started the introduction. Oh, uh, well, I'm Sophie Nevin. Um, I am actually from the West Coast. Um, mm -hmm. I grew up in a town 
that when I was in high school was by Out Magazine voted the gayest city in America. Um, wow. That was like our big thing. Um, Which town? Tacoma, Washington. Um, Tacoma's the gayest. Shout out. Not anymore, <laughs> but <laughs> when I was in high school, we got that. Um, wow. Uh, so I like was never not around queer people, and then I went to Bennington College, which is just also overrun by queer people. <laughs> yeah. um, and then I moved to the town, um, and it was the first time in my entire life that I was completely surrounded by only straight people. Um, and I remember like trying to have the same dialogues that I was having at Bennington or in my hometown with people that I love but who just had no sort of uh, idea that these conversations were happening. Um, and I felt like I was kind of screaming into this void <laughs> for about a year. Um, and then I remember seeing your Facebook post on like a completely not Queer Connect related specific pa Facebook page. And I was like, oh my, I was like at work and I like completely stopped working, <laughs> had to look everything up, immediately sent you a Facebook message because I was like, I need to not be screaming into a void. Um, and mm -hmm. I work full time, so it was a little more difficult for me to be like physically volunteering. Um, so I got the chance to work on publicity, which was something I could do in my spare time, on my lunch break. It was really great. Um, yeah, that's me. <laughs> and we've only just begun. Yes. Right? See, this is the key that this is the beginning. It's a, a wonderful beginning. It's pretty amazing when you can make a big splash like this. Uh, as your mm -hmm. start, right? And part of the challenge I think that I'm feeling right now is, okay, picking and choosing which parts, which threads of this to present when and how effectively, um, which requires a strategic plan. And that's kind of where Queer Connect is right now. We're gonna, now that Pride is done, we can actually, we are working on some, firming up some of the structural pieces um, and actually, w that's what we're going to be focused on between now and when you leave, which is only three weeks. Cool. <laughs> and then, um, and then, yeah, we already have some cool things planned. Um, but we are going to have another event very soon. I'm thinking October, for a pretty big event. And then, uh, obviously, we're starting planning. Not obviously, but we're starting planning for next year's Pride. We already have some of it. It's already the planning's already started. Um, but we'll have a pretty big planning meeting soon. That'll be announced, and then um, we'll start organizing. And this time, it will be a little. It will be qualitatively different and quantitatively different. And then some of the pieces will, I hope, just be exactly the same. Which is maintaining that it's joyful, that it is about pride, you know, and praise, praising the purpose of the pride parade. It's it's all about that, right? And mm -hmm. especially when there's people who are struggling with that because of course there's uh, we're all struggling in some way or another right and some are more obvious than others well, I'm you talk about you talk about the kids expressing that that need to see adults who are like them yeah. um, you talk about the new trans suicide hotline the mm. the suicide statistics of LGBTQ youth are horrifying yeah. are just horrifying so if if there were only to be one purpose, and I don't think there is just one purpose for Pride, if there were just one legitimate purpose, it's that. It's it's mm. it's showing um, young people, yes, it does get better. Yes, you you are worth celebrating just as you are. You are a beautiful human being, and, and we can all come together and, and, and celebrate who we are, whatever that means for us. That's right. And, uh, you know, one of the one of the kind of, I think, trends in, in queer culture is, um, we, you know, we keep finding new letters to add, right? But, but it's just that the diversity is so great, mm -hmm. right? That, mm -hmm. that we, we have so many different expressions and identities to, to celebrate. Um, so I, a lot of times we, we kind of bemoan how long the LGBTQQIA plus can get, but there's so much to celebrate there. That's such a great point, because that's one of the challenges that I think most people maybe aren't aware of, but within, like, the very first meeting, to me, I don't know, I just still, like, ah! I, I could run <laughs> yeah. off the energy of all these things <laughs> alone, but put them all together, and it's like, 
But that first meeting, at the at one moment, I real I had to stop. I just had to remember. I had to stop and say, "Wait a minute, let's just go." We don't have. There were so many we couldn't introduce ourselves. But I remember I said, "How many people here identify as gay?" Wah. How many people identify as lesbian? Wah. Different people. Uh, right and i just went through all the different terms and people yelled out some and there was every single term and every single identity facet somebody raised their hand and from i said i think i even said there was someone under 10. i think there was a nine-year-old like i can't remember for sure but there was there was every age remember that every age group was represented every single one is anyone in their teens? Yeah. Is anyone in their 20s? Yeah. 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. There was someone in their 80s in our group, and everyone just started, broke out cheering. Right? And then someone went, wait a minute, Lisa, stop. <laughs> this is my friend. I don't understand. What does non-binary gender, what, what does that mean? <laughs> and everyone kind of giggled, right? And I said, well, does someone want to say it? And one of the youngest persons raised their hand, right? And boop, said it. And my friend went, thank you. Oh, and everyone just burst out laughing. Like that's what was needed. Like an older, she's like, I'm just an old lesbian. How do I know that? And it was, it was like a complete celebration, honoring that there was like all this wisdom of every age and every race. We had different races, re religions. We had everything in that group. And like, it, this is not to be underestimated. I feel sorry for anyone who hasn't experienced that. And it doesn't happen often here. And mm -hmm. it's spectacular when you get in a room and you can celebrate your differences in a, a that in a, some basic way is affirming our shared humanity. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. That's it. It's just like, yeah. and we all just like st we just were like happy, right? Everyone was so happy. Um, and then the, then of course the challenge is, at some point something happens where somebody either gets scared. Usually it's about fear. Yeah. But wait a minute. What about us? Right. We're, there was nobody. Now at this meeting, there was someone from rep representation from pretty much everything. But that's highly unusual. So, and how do we honor that? There's this huge diversity and inclusivity is the word that comes to mind. Yeah, well, we ran into this when we were putting our game night together because okay. we were call, do we call it queer? Yeah. Which uh, I'm comfortable using as just a term for myself and as an umbrella term for everybody. Many are not. But many are not. They actually hate it. Right. Or do you use LGBTQ and then leave so many people feeling like they're that's not, not me. That, that's not me. Yeah. It's And this is where it comes into what we call it and the significance of our identities and how easy it is to say that I'm this to the exclusion of this. And younger people are mostly younger people that I give a lot of credit to that say, well, it isn't that, it's more fluid, it's, right. it's a spectrum, it's this, it's that. And then, yeah. and then that creates a whole other discomfort from other people. You can feel all of us going, mm, what, what did she say? <laughs> so, but in my mind, it isn't necessarily about the content. It, it's important to like recognize what we're talking about is valid mm -hmm. from our own experiences, right? To hear each other. Mm -hmm. Um, and then look at the process. We don't have to like become divisive about it. We can choose to actually come together about it, right? As one of the uh, older people in the room, um, it, I, I often look at discussions like this from a historical perspective. I grew up in Australia in a very conservative um, place and um, it was uh, it was a wonderful thing to me to have lived in one lifespan from a period where it was pretty rough when I was a kid um, in terms of violence and, and um, anti-gay rhetoric and activity through to a time when my partner and I, after 20 years together, could get married. Um, and I adopted two kids and, right, so I, I created the family that I used to dream of having when I was, when I was a teenager. So I think that as we, the LGBTQ community, have made greater strides towards equality, we are able now to open it out. It's not just white gay men who are, uh, who are enjoying the benefits of equality, but it's our responsibility now to make sure that that's open to everybody. And I remember when 
in my first relationship, we used to define ourselves as not gay or um, poofters, as the Australian term was. Uh, um, what is it? Poofter. What does that mean? <laughs> it's the same as the F word. Now, can we say faggot on um, yeah, cable access? I love that. Um, it's a P. It fits in. It's, the <laughs> oh, no. the it's, it's not a lovable expression, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, oh. But you reclaimed it. No. Actually, that, well, maybe. I mean, I haven't been in Australia for 35 years, so I maybe, but I don't think claim. anybody uses <laughs> I must it in the same way I as we've taken you queer think, back, you know. But you guys called yourself mm. that. No. Um, what I'm wrong. saying was Thank that you. we, Important. just my partner and I, in our theatrical arts community of very, you know, like-minded people, we used to not define ourselves by our sexuality or by our relationship, and we used to say that everything is... It's non-binary. We didn't use those words back then, but that's the way we thought of ourselves. And now, that's becoming a standard way to describe human sexuality and the great differences that there are. So we've made incredible strides, but we're still not equal, as Mark said. There's kids still dying, and, and the adults in our community now, there's, there's obviously many more. Um, what do you mean? Gay, there are many more gay people out there, I think, but who don't either don't self-identify that way or are in the closet who are scared of coming out. We have no way of knowing how many there are, but we suspect there are very many. So as we move forward with the planning, I think it would be great to have spaces, whether they're digital or community or physical or whatever spaces there are that make it okay for adults who've lived their lives in the closet to also Absolutely. maybe make steps towards self-acceptance. Mm -hmm. It's huge. It's huge. You said so much in that. We could break it down and talk for an hour about each one. But the idea of how we even recognize and um, identify and count yeah. is like, we, there, you know that right now they are changing the census so they're not going to count us again. We will not count right. LGBTQ people again. Um, so, you know, there's a cycle his historically. Um, and then there's still people that aren't counted. I mean, early on I mean, with the HIV and AIDS um, epidemic, I guess I'll say, there was such an awareness that in order to, to, to help stop the spread that we had to reach people who didn't identify as gay. So there's men who have sex with men. There's lots of men who have sex with men who would not ever say they're gay or bi or LGBTQ anything. They're married to a woman, and they have families, and then they're having sex with men completely in the closet. It's very common. And you say that, and still people go, <laughs> that's human behavior. Human behavior and identity are not the same thing. It's completely different. Right. No, it is. I mean, there's, there's, your sexuality is so complicated. Because there, there's this physical attraction, there's sexual attraction, and then there's the romantic attraction. And a lot of those guys would say, "I'm just, I'm not romantically attracted to another man. I'm, I'm not gay." And that, and we need to be open enough to say, "Okay, well, that, that's, that's a, that's a sexuality too, and there's validity to that." Now, you, you mm -hmm. should live that life authentically and honestly, and, and if you're in a committed relationship you know, openly with your, you know, with your partner, so you're not doing things to damage your marriage, mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, I mean, so I think that, the, you know, it's, it's funny how sometimes these things will push back on us and, and, and stretch us to go be, be further. I mean, I would just say to your point about how that there are people out there, maybe they want to come out and they're, that, that, that is the one place where I have an ability to uh, offer myself and my church as a safe space for that. You can contact me, we can meet in private, um, and we can, I can help with that in a, in a way that, Absolutely. that coming to a Queer Connect event would be probably... <laughs> Not a possibility yeah. yet. <laughs> Likewise, I'm a psychotherapist in private practice, and that's a safe right. place for many people right. to come to explore. And um, and then there's also Queer Connect and myself in that position. And that is the whole point of Queer Connect, is there are resources 
and to connect that so we can reach out more and make that known to more people who then have that vehicle we were talking about earlier, that structure, that vehicle, that you say, oh, there is a place I can go to just talk to someone about this, just to sort it out. It's safe, right? That's big. <coughs> yeah, <coughs> I'm thinking that uh, in my universal Unitarian experience, uh, we get speaker after speaker after speaker who's there trying to just pry our acceptance level open a little wider to accept more people. You know, we always talk about this in very general terms, but I think you must, you know, be into that too. You know, yeah, the pulpit. I mean, while we, you know, from my perspective, that's what, you know, God is constantly doing. No. <laughs> we say God is still speaking. And I think, uh -huh. I think God is constantly challenging us to, to love more people. God creates this incredible diversity of human beings to say, love them. Mm -hmm. That's, to me, that's the whole bag is, is love. And, so, and yeah. us as have the gift of knowing how to love. Mm -hmm. Because if you can confront fears like this, then you mm -hmm. have a gift that that adversity is a gift. Anyone yeah. who has to come out has a and gift. Find enough love for themselves. Absolutely, and there's no way that can't ripple out, and that to me is what happens at Pride. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's what happens. There's a rippling out of love, and um, and and claiming that as our, I guess I'll say our birthright. It's my. I deserve this. When you first go, I'll never forget when I first did my first gay Pride, and it was in New York City. It was nothing that feels like that or has felt like that since to me. Mm -hmm. And. Um, and then our pride here is nothing that's felt like that either. Wholly different. So, you were at I had, I had this moment, and, and I think I have this moment every time I march in pride, but mm -hmm. I had this moment of coming down the street and hearing the people cheering and thinking about the ways in which I was growing up, I was told, you know, this is wrong, this is keep that secret or um, mm -hmm. the ways that you're told that you're you're, you're wrong um, and to have that be celebrated is, is very powerful um, and very necessary and very necessary because we grew up in a straight world yeah. so everything we were told except you who grew up in the gay the gay wonderland of the west I, well, I also had a weird experience where because there were so many people who were out coming out was sort of it was a it was a uh, a weird strain because a lot of people were like you don't have to come out it's you know everyone's yeah. queer here yeah. um <laughs> and that's not always true um and so I didn't really ever have before coming here like a lot of moments of saying like, I am queer, and being able to own that identity, and I feel like, in a way, that it wasn't a negative thing, but I did closet myself in a lot of situations, mm -hmm. because everyone's queer, so I can just blend in, I never have to be the person having these conversations and being outward, and so being able to, this is the first time I've ever marched, and like, mm -hmm. first time saying, I think, publicly, like, I'm queer, and, and actually having to come out, um... Yeah. So I just think it's an interesting dynamic. It's great. It is interesting. I have to say, I got to hear a part of the story slam that you, that you, t I, I'm so happy that I got to hear that. <laughs> it was really hard for me not to be able to sit in any one place that day and just get all of it. Um, but I loved what you said, what you shared. It was so powerful. It's and I, wa I love that I watched from the outskirts and I felt how it was rippling through the room. I, you know, and there was a lot of young people really happy there's a lot of young people at that part too but like you said something that struck me as so it just resonated which is i come out a little bit every day something not to put words in your mouth mm -hmm. but I was, yes that's what you're talking about right mm -hmm. like yeah we, each of us like right now we're picking yeah. what to come out with and what we do and don't say um yes every time you're on the phone with a mm -hmm. health insurer or some mm -hmm. bureaucracy or something yeah. are you married right. Oof. yes yeah. What's your spouse's name? His name is Arnold. Coming out. Mm -hmm. I came out on the phone yesterday. It's uh, something that you have to do over and over again. 
That's a part that I or you could most wear people don't understand. Rainbow t shirts or <laughs> and wonder wristbands. who gets it. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean it, why why it's such a relief to when you find a store or a restaurant that has a pride flag on it or even yeah. if it's exactly. even if it's only that sticker on the door yeah. that that says, Oh, I can That's breathe great. in this space. I don't yeah. have to worry about what happens if I'm, you know, outed or and for how, me, I don't even how, I don't even know that that's happening for me until yeah. I then notice that I'm relieved. Right. Like, right. Oh, right. Oh, how long have I let that go and not recognize I've let it go? We we uh, we were really practiced at holding our breath. You know, and I think um, that's great. I think though that queer pride has something to um, a gift to give to the the non queer. Yeah our non-queer brothers and sisters out there that um, we all get messages constantly in this culture that you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're, you, you don't look good enough, you're too fat, you're too skinny, you're too, 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 you're not, or you're just not enough. And to, to have pride and say, no, I am enough, just the way I am, and I'm worth celebrating, that's, that's a gift. And I think, mm -hmm. I think that's why there are so many straight allies that want to be involved in pride and want to be at the event because they totally they we all desperately need that kind of yes I, so many people have told me that straight out said it pun wasn't intended <laughs> <laughs> um and i've had the whole spectrum of that to me a woman hmm. just casually spontaneously saying yeah, anyone who says it's a choice, what's their problem? If it was a choice, I would totally be a lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> I started cracking up laughing at me. Uh, but I really like men. <laughs> it's hysterical, right? Because she that's what she, that's it. It's like, and she wasn't referring to the lesbians who are too scared to tell anyone they're a lesbian. She was talking about a lesbian who reclaimed her sense of lesbianism, whatever that means to them. It's the process, right? And it, the, being proud of yourself is contagious. Yeah, so I think the ultimate purpose of pride is to understand that everyone walks yeah. around holding their breath. Yeah. What if this is discovered about me? What, what can I show in this situation? And mm -hmm. what if we can create more and more spaces where everybody can just breathe and <laughs> let be themselves and know that they're safe and that they'll be, they'll be honored and celebrated. It's, that's, I think, a worthy goal. I came out in a bar, and the, the bar that I came out in a rural New York town w also had a lot of um, couples who were mixed couples racially, so there will be black and white couples who couldn't go anywhere else, so they're at the gay bar. Yeah. Um, and there was a, a, a lot of those elements in where they couldn't feel safe right. to be who they are would come out, and it was not a problem. It was something we all knew, we all celebrated, we all allowed that we embraced it actually it was horrifying to me when I finally got to go to my dream place which is I'm in the Castro in San Francisco I'm in the Castro in San Francisco ah! and I go out in there and I got treated horribly by the gay men it was horrifying I, I was like yeah hello I'm they ignored me outright nasty to me I had not ever experienced that before I came out with my gay brothers like it was like uh, kind of shocking to me and then I that was the first lesson but as you travel around you realize yeah. it's actually really rare that there's a place that celebrates all of our differences so that's it that's you know I'm I'm this come coming back to the parade um, you were at World Pride I was yes I oh, wow. so kind of want to hear because to me yes World I had Pride, to miss the parade in Bennington because I'd already committed to uh, World Pride, which was the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, um, and it was in New York City where I had been there for the 25th anniversary of Stonewall Parade. And as you said, it's amazing because everybody's gay. I often say I always assume people are gay until they tell me they're straight, just as a way to answer the world, you know? Um, but. At, on, at a pride parade in New York City, it's true. Yeah. Everybody's gay. 
Yes, yeah, so the there are city. there are like, there are groups in the parade that are allies. Like P Flag historically has been has been there, but overwhelmingly it's everyone's right. gay. So that's a whole part of that's why that it, it makes me chuckle when the kids said that to you because you got it right away that oh they're not all gay, right? You were very aware. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of allies. But even if they're personally not gay, that day they're gay. The police <laughs> motorcycles that lead the parade have pride flags on the back of yes, their motorcycles. That's right. So the I think that's what happens in a parade. It's like mm -hmm. the only time the straight people are the minority. That's right. That's by right. choice. Yes. <laughs> by choice. Which is a really interesting thing too. Yeah. So, mm. you know, as soon as and this is a really big thing I think that I I have found that straight people don't get. But for coming out of that experience, I remember I'll never forget it and I, it's happening to me now. When you come in it, when you're in it and you experience what that's like and then you go back to the re rest of the world is oh, Okay, so now they're taking the flags back down. That was really moving for me yeah. to watch them put them up. And I watched them put it up by myself, and I watched them take the last one down by myself. Because I was, I guess, the only one who was so inspired to go out earlier. They did it early in the morning, and it, it's an interesting thing to me. I like it. But getting up really early and watching the town come alive. But I sat and I just cried after the weekend and cried and cried more, cried more. And it wasn't because they were putting the flags away, per se. Yeah. But it was just the intensity of everything and, and not even knowing how like to contain it, really, right? Where do you put all this energy? Yeah, we couldn't really process all of our emotions throughout the whole weekend because we were just busy constantly doing everything. Um, so then by the time it was Monday, we were, we were both just emotional and exhausted. It went on longer than I thought for me. I'm still a little tired from it, and it's kind of shocking because I don't think I've ever experienced this longevity of tiredness. You were sprinting pretty hard <laughs> for three solid months. I've done a lot of things months. in my life, and yeah. I, but yes, I know it was, it was. And the sprinting piece was, it, yeah. There's that's a part it of it. It wasn't a marathon. These things should be a marathon. Months. <laughs> yeah, of yeah that's true. It, it was. It was a three month it sprint. Was a three, three two month and a half sprint. month sprint. There was something constantly every minute, yeah. many things constantly every minute. And then, like, like I think we were recognizing there's so many pieces here that we could do a whole hour at least talking about this one little piece of what we're talking about, yet it's yeah. all, like, compacted. But, hmm. When I was 10 years old, somebody, I don't know, gave me an autograph book. You remember autograph books? Yeah. And... Um, I used to try to get autographs of people. It's, <laughs> I'm seeing the young people are puzzled. Um, it's a book <laughs> in which you collect people's autographs, right? Instead of handing people a, oh, it's a selfie nowadays, but right. back then you handed somebody a pen and they wrote an autograph. Well, I didn't know anybody, so I used to ask friends and family and whoever was coming over to the house to write in my autograph book. And a distant cousin, um, a, a woman of a certain age, wrote, something that really hit me and has lived with me ever since. And it was a quote. It may be from scripture, which, Mark, you might be able to identify it for me, or, or she just made it up. I don't know. It said, when men speak ill of thee, live so that none may believe them. So I think that's what I've tried to do and what I will continue to try to do is the base level of what I can do as an LGBTQ person, which is just live it honestly and live as well as with as much good as I can, right? So that if bad things are going to be said, they're not really about something that I've done or, or choices I've made. And I think that's the base level of what we need to do mm -hmm. to take the parade through the year live honestly and openly and help other people to live honestly and openly. Which includes, to me, it's so compelling, thank you, as you're so, I'm so appreciative of your articulate, huh. <laughs> of your ability to do that. Um, you know, there, people are struggling and we're all struggling in some way and there, there, it, there was negativity. There was negativity. And to our credit of the team and our planning, um, we did not let that become the focus. There were things that happened. 
Some of those things only I know about and a few other people. Um, and I know that there's other things and when people start sharing with me, there will be people who have had something happen that in the midst, in the larger picture, they were able, and this is the key part, they kept their focus on the positive. Mm -hmm. At any time, we make the choice. Do we give this my energy or this my energy? Is what that quotation says, right? Mm -hmm. We could get sucked into by what other people are saying, but then it doesn't necessarily, that's our choice, right? We can stay with what's true to us. I love that. I just love that. And not to the exclusion, not denying that that exists. Because then we lose the opportunity to let the healing ripple out. I do feel like it's our responsibility. I feel like we're like sacred beings. That anyone who's overcome something that's, that's shameful, scary, taboo, I don't care what word you use. When you come and in yourself, you find your authenticity and your true self. And it's not... I don't know, you could probably say, you could all probably say this better than I am, but you get what I'm saying, yeah. right? I can feel it. Yeah. Then, okay, it's not just about me, because I'm with all you guys, and there's someone here who's actually obviously struggling with that. How do we know? Well, because they're addicted, or they're violent, or, or right? Or they're just, and they're depressed, or suicidal. Whatever manifestation is, it means they're suffering. We know how to deal with suffering in a way that we can transcend it. And it's sort of our duty, our obligation as a human being to share that, right? Yeah. And that's what I'm most proud about, that we did that. Because believe me, in this town, we all know there's been a temptation recently to still stay stuck in the negativity and the weaknesses and the, the deficits. And, and I think it's way time yeah. to get to, right. to say, this is yeah. what we're good at. And let's come together and do yeah. more of that. And it's mm -hmm. contagious, right? Love wins. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> you said that the gay community is quite prevalent at Benning College. I was wondering, you know, there's always this effort <clears throat> on both sides, I guess the town and the <coughs> gown, to interact. Did you ever get a sense that there was any, e any initiative on the part of students to try to relate to town? Ooh, that's <laughs> such a good question. That is a very complicated uh, answer. I feel like... Um, Bennington students uh, within themselves are pretty divided in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. um, usually along class lines, um, which is a frustration to a lot of people <laughs> who are currently there. Um, and so I know, and then I also know that like the town and the college are very divided along class lines in a lot of way, uh, a lot of ways. And so I know that the there's this struggle on the campus to sort of find common ground within itself. Um, and to promote activism within itself and to come together um, and get rid of those divides. And I feel like there's a lot of strain on how to like do that while also mm -hmm. trying to become part of this community. Um, and I feel like this community outside falls by the wayside during the sort of daily going to classes with people that you might not feel comfortable with or um, have, I don't know, uh, feel that they make your life a little bit worse um, or a little <laughs> bit better and that, that's, a, that's a constant thing it's such a small campus it's so insular that um, I think their focus as students is is divided in a lot of ways um, and I feel like they want to be a part of this community a lot more at least in my period of time there mm -hmm. um, and it's it's difficult to find connections um, especially if you're not from here. Uh, a lot of the students don't leave campus very often. It's, um, I think it's a, it's a very complicated a situation for each yeah, individual right, student. Right. Yeah. But I can speak to that. Just yesterday I got an email from a student mm -hmm. who um, was at the first meeting and basically, she's lovely, um, she's felt the need to apologize because she felt bad that she had other things happen that were yeah. very intense life things, but needed to self, self care. Yeah. And basically, I'm, I'm so honored that, that she felt that she could tell me that. And then also, um, you know, um, say, I can't wait to come back and join Queer Connect when she comes back for the next semester. Awesome. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. She thanked me. She said, thank you for being someone in this community 
who and the students do want that mm -hmm. and um, that's that's a perfect example of one of them and there's lots of them the middle school kids the the middle school came to the parade with their official Mount Antonini middle school banner mm -hmm. and then yeah. other people why isn't the high school well they'll come I don't have any doubt <laughs> <laughs> We, we have the challenge still to make those pathways to connect right. better and that's in process it's happening and to recognize where the challenges are and what they are um, is a really important first step and then and then I think this is my own personal thing that I've come to like really value is that once we recognize what it is our job then is to click into what we do want and that's I think what we're struggling with as a culture pri primarily is we already know what the problem some of us don't quite get it yet that's true but those of us that do it's challenging because we we are in a role of showing the person what the problem is and then the key is we have to get right into what we do want because otherwise we get stuck in the problem even though we know what it is so does that make sense so someone like you Sophie you have so much insight about this <laughs> and you know it's a lot of work right to, to like negotiate mm -hmm. How do I, how do I actually help? Is a really good question. And I mean, I think part of the part of the uniqueness about Bennington College is that the faculty aren't in residence either. Mm -hmm. So the, the faculty don't have those kind of community connections mm -hmm. that they could have help yeah. Yeah. help create those pathways uh -huh, for yeah. the students. Yeah, I mean, I, my hometown is Meadville, Pennsylvania, where Allegheny College is, and that's very much a college town. And mm -hmm. The college has a lot of, a lot of influence in that town because it's got a, a faculty that is involved in, in mm -hmm. town. So, I think that's Good one point. of the real challenges for for Bennington College, in terms of connecting to the to the wider community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <coughs> It's interesting. We were reading this book recently, mm. the home of um, the interviews with the Dalai Lama mm. and Bishop Tutu. Oh. Uh, and the one thing that the Dalai Lama keeps on coming back to is that in his meditation, every day he prays for eight, seven and a half, eight billion people. You know, you know, his concern is to, you know, as you say, make sure that he is fully aware that everyone is, is as important as everyone else, you know, and they say that doesn't... That's yeah. what pride is. Mm -hmm. I'm no better than anyone else, but I'm no worse than anyone else. Mm -hmm. I, that's... Equanimity of yeah. some sort. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now that is a Buddhist equanimity, is a Buddhist practice. So you, the, the Dalai Lama practices that in so many different forms all of life and many lives. <laughs> right? Like that's part of the, the lineage. I mean, we're all in a lineage. We're, we all, some of us recognize it in different ways. Mm -hmm. and, but we, and there actually is a lineage. Yeah. And some we of us rebel against our lineage. <laughs> and <laughs> yes, and that's part of the need, right? Yeah. Because rebelling against something that's not sure. okay is critical. Sure. Well, you know, you were talking about how you came out in a bar. Yeah. Well, that was the safe space. Right. And, and you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, shame on the churches, shame on the churches, shame on the churches, <laughs> because this is what church should be, yeah. a it safe space for people to be who they are, be who they were created to be. Um, and so it's, it's... Even my dorm wasn't a safe place, even though I had wonderful people trying to make it that way. Yeah. Um, it just wasn't, so I just escaped. Me and all my friends escaped, and that's where we lived. We used to joke about it. That our cots, our beds, our real beds were down at the bar. Hmm. And so many, there's so many casualties in, the, in terms of addiction. You know, the LGBTQ community has one of the, still has the highest rates of substance use um, problems in every age group. Because we of die young. Shame and depression. Killing and ourselves. Yeah. Just yeah. killing ourselves and, and the coping mechanisms. You know, that and I, shame on the churches, shame on the churches, <laughs> because, I mean, who is, who is spreading that message so broad and so loudly in our culture is, is still, unfortunately, the evangelical Christian church. Um, so this is one of the reasons I had to 
felt the need to become a pastor myself is to, to rebel against it. Can you say a little since you're talking about this, because I was so happy about what you did for Pride in terms of getting other local spiritual people together. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we could have just marched as our church. I mean, and, mm -hmm. um, but I opened it up to um, other people of any faith, basically, and tried to get as many clergy people to, um, to join us as well and, and be clergyfied, I told them, <laughs> <laughs> whatever that meant for them, wear stoles or... Um, and so, yeah, I, I wanted it to be something that anybody could feel comfortable with no matter what their faith was. So the banner said, um, faithfully LGBTQ and allies too. Uh, LGBTQ affirming people of faith. And so we had um, Jewish people walking with us and Christians from different, from several different denominations. Um, and I, I don't know if there were any Buddhists. I'm sure there were some Buddhists, but because I didn't go through and say, who are you? What are you doing? But um, it had that wonderful energy. I yeah. loved it. I felt it just even when I was in that energy. Like as I was walking with the bullhorn screaming, <laughs> it was really neat because I could feel the different energies of the different groups. It was tangible, all of it. It was, it was a rainbow. There's no question uh, about that. And for me, I mean, I've, I think I've only ever marched in parades with a church, oh, or wow. because I, um, because that's where so much of the negativity in our culture comes from. I, I think it's so, um, I, I want to be part of the voice against that from, from the religious left, so. But I love what, personally I just have to say, I love that what you did was you didn't protest against what was happening. No. You created the space of what you wanted and everyone came. That's, I think, mm, and, yeah. and I'm not minimizing the role of protest, because I'm looking, thinking, you know, Stonewall, and the, there's a lot of people right. writing about that that yes, this came from a protest. I still honestly, I just really deeply believe that if 49 years ago, all the organizers only did a protest, we wouldn't be celebrating Pride 50 years later the way we are. I'm thankful that they mm -hmm. celebrated themselves the next year and made it a party, a celebration. There's protest too. That's a huge part of it. But that was not the predominant piece. Why? Because yeah, you know, you have to celebrate yourself if no one else is for sheer survival. You know, there's a lot to be said for that. Well, and I think that, I mean, this kind of goes back to something you said earlier about getting getting past and setting aside the negativity and, and um, that one of the purposes for Pride in Bennington is to show Bennington what it looks like to yeah. have pride. <laughs> that that yes. Bennington it needs to look past the negativity and look past what, oh, what we can't do and look at what we can do and what our gifts are because right. um, we we do have gifts. We do have great people here that we can, we, we don't have to die the way that people think we're going to die as a town. That there's, there's, there's something we're celebrating here beyond that battle that happened 10 miles away. <laughs> right. <laughs> Over the border. Over the border. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Those people? Mm -hmm. But the people of Bennington are worth celebrating. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. about what we are right now. Yeah. <clears throat> and what, what kind of future we can create together, both in terms of our LGBT communities and in terms of the wider Bennington community. Mm. Well, it's a wonderful, wonderful concluding statement. And I thank you all so much for coming today. It's been marvelous. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Well. Yay, she's flying a flag over our head. <laughs>